Hello everyone, my name is Rishad Shafiq and on behalf of the co-authors Adrian Wilden and Alex Yakovlev, I will be presenting the following paper today. Explainability and Dependability Analysis of Learning Automata Based AI Hardware. Uh, we are from Newcastle University's Microsystems Research Group. Uh, over the last few months we had been um, working a lot on a new AI algorithm, i.e. Uh, Learning Automata. Um, we will also be often referring to this one as Setlin Machine, which is uh, originally um, uh, named after Mikhail Setlin, who invented uh, Setlin Automaton in 1960s. And lately, of course, uh, Professor Oleg Christopher Granmo from University of Agda, who is one of our close collaborators on, on this project, uh, has also been uh, you know, uh, working with us in some exciting directions. So today uh, we will be talking about um, a few things. We will be first uh, introducing the concept of explainability and the problems therein. Uh, we will then uh, draw uh, some inspirations from the latest developments of uh, AI hardware architectures that we are uh, leading on. And then we will talk about how we uh, see uh, explainability in terms of reachability and how we um, can establish uh, understanding of explainability and dependability using this new uh, hardware architecture. Now, I'm sure we will all appreciate that one of the um, biggest challenges of modern day machine learning to foster as a pervasive implementation uh, you know, paradigm is the fact that we don't yet know how to explain our uh, machine learning algorithms. And this problem um, relates to not just one particular stakeholder, which is the engineers, but also the users, the application developers, and also the general public. Uh, we all want to know how can a decision be made from uh, raw data, which is otherwise, uh, how can we relate the output classifications from the input data? We want to know, or we want to find out how to trust the AI decisions and we also want to want to find out how to uh, uh, you know craft the data sets in the right order to make sure that we always uh, take care of um, you know AI decisions in the most safe and uh, and uh, sound manner. Now, of course, these uh, these are uh, incredible challenges, and uh, the challenges are obviously uh, uh, um, uh, exacerbated further by the fact that we have designed neural networks over the past uh, uh, few decades. And the complexity of uh, neural networks um, is by all means uh, nothing less than uh, you know something like a black box. If you think about it, uh, here is a very conceptual diagram of a neural network. And as you can see, uh, from the input to the output, uh, there are multiple paths, really. So these paths are, are dominated by uh, arithmetic paths as well, multiple arithmetic, for example, um, uh, additions, multiplications, and cascaded, uh, you know, uh, multi-layered fashion of these things as well. And also, if you consider the variations of the input values as well as the number of uh, possible combinations of weights you can have in, in uh, many, many hidden layers, it's possible that you can have almost uh, an almost infinite uh, number of combinations possible. Uh, now, that doesn't help because that goes back to this uh, square one problem, which is uh, we uh, we have a machine learning solution where we do not know uh, how to relate the outputs to back to the inputs uh, in a responsible manner. We do not know how to explain the machine learning in the first place. Now, what are we doing differently in terms of the new hardware architecture? I think this is where uh, it's uh, worth looking at the uh, architecture in a bit, uh, a bit further details. So the first and foremost thing is that there are three uh, uh, particular aspects in learning automata based AI hardware. And uh, I'll also be referring to our viewers and listeners to refer to the one of the papers that I'll be ref in pointing to at the very end uh, to read further on uh, so that uh, you can get some ideas about uh, learning automata based AI hardware in general. So the three aspects that I was just talking about, you have the first aspect is the data encoding. Second aspect is the reinforcement part, which has, uh, which actually allows you to learn uh, the relationship between the input and the output. Input meaning the uh, machine learning dataset, and output meaning the classifications that you have already labeled for your machine learning. 
And finally, you have the inference uh, uh, hardware or inference part, which is uh, responsible for making decisions from your uh, input data directly once uh, they are trained. Now, the first part, which is the uh, data encoding part, is very different from what you would see in normal neural networks. Uh, we call this one as Booleanization. It's different from binarization uh, per se, because in binarization, what you do is you uh, take a natural number and you represent the number in some uh, binary order where the positional significance is important for uh, representing the uh, value or information presented in that number. However, in Booleanization process, what you do is you extract the uh, informational content of your original value in terms of some Boolean, uh, you know, set of Booleans. Now, uh, you can decide how many features you will have in your uh, raw booleans, which would essentially mean that how many raw binarized features you will have. And once you have the binarized features, it will then go into something called a crossbar, some crossbar-like architecture of uh, a Cetlin automata, which is the basic architecture of the reinforcement part. So, so we have not talked about the data encoding part, and the encoded data, which is the boolean set of booleans, will go into the uh, reinforcement part. And the reinforcement part, what happens is, in the next slide, I'll talk about the, the basic concept of the Cetlin automaton. So you have, uh, if you have L number of, uh, you know, Boolean features, then you will essentially have the complements included. So that would mean that you will have two L number of uh, uh, Booleanized literals. And these literals will have their corresponding Cetlin automaton. And each automaton will be basically transitioning some states and their actions within a bounded space, meaning that uh, during the process of learning, what you do is you reinforce uh, more and more towards a more convincing way of finding out which action allows for the system to produce the best possible outcomes. And by doing that, you will be uh, presenting something, as I said, like a crossbar architecture where you will be selecting or deselecting, in other words, including or excluding the binarized or the booleanized literals that you have generated from your data encoding uh, process. Once the uh, including or excluding process is done within a certain clause, then the next process is to basically uh, create many, many copies of these clause so that you can have different clauses providing different types of variations of logic formations that you can offer. And then these clauses will eventually produce something called the majority voting between them. For example, some um, clauses will possibly generate some spurious logic formations, whereas some clauses will provide a more meaningful formation of the propositional logic. As you can see, one of the clear distinctions of Cetlin automata uh, or the, uh, the learning automata is the fact that we, are, we now have something uh, very different from the neural networks, which is propositional logic. We don't have any arithmetic heavy routines at all. So in a typical uh, setting, you would have, for example, in each class, you will have n number of clauses. And if you have m classes, then you would have in total something like 2L times m times n. That's how many Cetlin automata you will have. And the n clauses in each class will then go into a majority voting circuit to decide for the classification of that particular class. For example, if most of the uh, clauses agree on a certain direction of definition by saying uh, providing their outputs in terms of, let's say, zeros and ones, they would then be uh, favoring a certain type of, type of classification. And again, all of this is done in a reinforcement environment, meaning that uh, you, once, you, once you have trained the system, you, your system will know exactly how to select your propositional logic formations in the right order to make sure that your, your accuracy of the classification is always uh, the best possible uh, you can. Now, worth noting here, we don't have a significant problem with the multipath uh, logic formation. We don't have significant problem with the arithmetic. We don't uh, actually have a lot of arithmetic here at all. We have only logic formations. We also don't have the problem of uh, multi-layered uh, solutions. In fact, uh, if, you, if you look at the architecture carefully, it's a highly parallel architecture where individual clauses will be having Cetlin automaton uh, uh, and a good uh, set of these Cetlin automata, and each of these will be independent of each other, completely independent of each other. There is no cascading. There is no uh, multi-layering. There is no 
uh, multipart distribution between them. So this becomes an ideal solution for uh, providing something along the lines of explainable AI solution. And that's why uh, we, we carried on doing some reachability analysis. I, I think you will appreciate with me that uh, one way to, uh, as engineers, one way to understand explainability is to understand how the decisions are made during training from the input data into the, into the output classification. Now, in order to do that, this is what we will do. Um, uh, and I think it's important that before we go into the further details of the uh, uh, you know, reachability analysis, it's important that we understand the settling automaton. Settling automaton is, is, is something that, as I mentioned, uh, was proposed by Mikhail Settling in 1960s. The whole idea is that you have a bounded state space. Um, in this particular example, a very simple bounded space, state space with six different states. As you can see, uh, each state is clearly defined by the transition from the neighboring states. For example, S3 could only transition from S2 or from S4, either by penalizing from S4 into S3 or by rewarding from S3 into S2. Now, these things can be defined, uh, obviously defined by some logic formations uh, along the lines of this. Uh, and if, you, if it, is, it is really a, a set of uh, simplified expressions for the state transitions. Uh, you will obviously need to include the probabilistic uh, probabilistic pathways as well, which we haven't done uh, in this particular exercise to make it simple. So now, because there is a clear action boundary, the three states on the left will define, let's say, one particular action. In this particular example, we take it that this is an exclude action. And on the other hand, we uh, other side, we have the other action, which is the action to include action. Now, if the... Reinfor during the reinforcement stage, you can uh, go towards a more uh, confirmed action. This process will be called as rewarding. But if you transition from the, let's say, uh, from the confirmed action S1 to, let's say, uh, more towards the uh, action boundary, this process will be called penalizing. Now, obviously, uh, a good algorithm will allow you to uh, converge from having an initial state of let's say either S3 or S4 and then after doing a few reinforcements uh, and as, as well as let's say some uh, rewarding of the uh, of the of the of the settling automaton what you'll have is you will have some convergence in the form of let's say the states uh, in the order of let's say S1 or S2 or maybe S5 or S6 and again this is a very simplified example only six states Three states uh, belong to exclude action, and three states belong to include action. Now, in the following example, what we will be doing is we will be looking at how these bounded state space state space can be exploited towards fully reachable relationship between the states and actions. So we will be drawing the example of a two-input XOR gate and I think it's an interesting example for simplicity and also for the fact for the fact that it has a lot of uh, complementarity in the data set as well so there are four entries here we're looking at uh, 0 0 um, uh, the two binary features of 0 0 producing a 0 or 1 1 producing a 0 uh, on the other hand you have two binary input features uh, producing let's say 0 1 and 1 0 uh, will be producing something uh, which is 1 now, uh, so in your process of training, what we will be doing is that we will be providing one data point at a time. For example, the values x0 being 0 and x1 being 0 will define one data point. And ideally, because we haven't really learned uh, the system relationship yet, so we will start with a very, uh, uh, very early, uh, you know, we'll start with a very, we will start with an initial random state for the settling automaton. As you can see, initially the state was S3, but through a penalizing uh, action, we have moved from S3 to S4. Now, after having seen this data point, the system has already transitioned to that, and that has maintained, uh, that has meant that the, this particular literal, which is X0, without any complement, will be included because of the fact that it is now in the state S4. Likewise, the the point of let's say the 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 literal which is x1 being zero right now because of the uh, 
uh, no action at all, it will still remain at the S3, which would mean that this will be excluded. Now, because the complement of x0 is also included, which is the 1 is included, uh, the output of this clause, irrespective of everything else there is, output of this clause will be equal to 1. Now, I haven't shown the other clause outputs. There are four clauses in this particular example. So because of the dominance of this clause output being 1 and the other, others being 0 each, the output itself, the actual output will be classified as 1, which is wrong, obviously. So as you can see, the expected output is 0 and the, 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 uh, the, the current output is 1. That will now allow us to go to the next reinforcement step with the next uh, data, the set of data points. And here, what will happen is when you have the next data point, you will have, let's say, the x0 will be now 0 and x1 will be now 1 and your expected output is 1. And you will be generating, because of the transition, as you can see, now we have had a penalty from S4 into S3 for the literal corresponding, for the TA corresponding to the literal of uh, x0. Likewise, the the uh, TA1, the second uh, TA which is corresponding to the x1 will not transition anything else. There, there will be no action whatsoever. However, for the final TA, which is the TA3, which is corresponding to x1 prime, will have a, uh, will have a reward from S3 into S1. As you can see, as you continue learning more and more, this is just the iteration number, uh, iteration number second, uh, iteration number one, data point two. If you carry on doing more data points as well as more iterations, after eleven iterations, this is what you will see. Because of the bounded state uh, reinforcements uh, in many iterations, you will see that at some point the system has already converged to this state, which is, let's say, the first TA will have the state one. S1, meaning that it will be excluded for the, the first literal, which is X0, will be excluded. The second uh, TA, which is TA1, will have reinforced to S6, meaning that the literal X1 will be included. And of course, the uh, third TA, which is TA2, will be reinforced to S6, meaning that the X0 prime will always be included. And the final TA, which is TA3, will be reinforced to S1, meaning that X1 prime will always be excluded. Now, if you look at this expression, what we are seeing is that we want X0 to be excluded, X1 to be included, X0 bar to be included. So basically you have an AND expression between X1 and X0 bar, and of course this is excluded. This is the propositional logic expression that allows us to create this correlation between these two tables. The expected outputs are 0, 1, 1, 0, and the actual outputs are also 0, 1, 1, 0. That is after 11 reinforcement steps. Very fast and still through the bounded state transitions and also the defined number of uh, uh, you know transitions that you have, we have now achieved 100% accuracy for the machine learning problem. This is again a very simple uh, example we have picked up on only for us to appreciate the power of, uh, you know, understanding the reachability. Now, let's summarize what we have uh, seen so far. So, in two words, really, uh, if we have to summarize what had, uh, we have seen so far, because we have bounded state transitions and clearly defined state action boundaries, the settled machine itself maintains a high level of reachability and as such explainability. And remember, this explainability that we, uh, the, the way we have defined it is basically the way we see the learning is affecting the state transitions and the reachability of the states uh, towards uh, a, a fully learned state, a fully converged state. Now, second point here to pick up on is the fact that the input literals will only propagate through a finite number of clauses to form an interpretable pro propositional logic. I've already picked up on this example, what I have shown previously, that if you go uh, if you have already learned your state, you have a propositional logic come out, coming out of your individual clauses. And these clauses will then uh, vote into the majority voting circuit to make sure that the ones that are defining the problem correctly, the, in terms of the propositional logic, will eventually get selected by the system automatically. 
Next up, let's uh, study the impact of reachability if we have faults. Faults are natural in some uh, systems. Faults can happen because of human errors. Faults can happen uh, because of hardware uh, manifestations. Faults, faults can happen because of uh, uh, fabrication and all kinds of reasons. Now, in order to uh, study faults in our uh, experiments, what we have done is that we have used um, one of our system C oriented uh, 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 up where we, the original system C types were replaced by a new fault enabled system C data types. And these uh, data types have special uh, uh, annotations where you can actually uh, say that there is a fault present or not present. So using that programming model, what we did is we uh, designed the, uh, the two input XOR example of the Settlin automaton. And then we injected, once we enabled a fault, uh, in, the, in this particular case, we enabled the fault in a, in a certain uh, Settlin automaton called the TA0, which you have seen previously. Now, because the TA0 is now has now got a fault uh, in the in the in the most significant uh, bit, as you can see, what's happening over here is that uh, initially the assumption here is that for the first Settlin automaton, we now have a fault in the least significant bit. We'll also study the uh, impact of faults in different, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, bit positions as well. But let's now consider a fault in the least significant significant bit for a settling, a settling automaton with uh, six different states. Now, here's the thing. Uh, we have considered a very simple example where we have only six different states. Now, with a stock at fault in, uh, stock at one fault in the least significant bit, the values that we can possibly have under the faulty circumstances would be one or a three or a five or a seven. Seven is not an allowed value and uh, that we ensure by making sure that there is a modulus suppression in the settling automaton every time, every cycle. Now, although originally in the first data point, we have had the, the initial random position state of let's say S3, but because of the fault, what would happen over here is the system originally wanted a transition from S3 to S4, but because S4 is not one of the allowable values, allowed values, it will jump to uh, a state of S5 directly. That would mean that it will basically go through two-step reinforcement, which is not what we wanted, but this is something that is happening because we have a fault. In the next data point, it will start uh, to, to reinforce further by a reward into the uh, state of S6. And again, because S6 is not one of the allowed values, and through the uh, and you can imagine if you have if you have gone to the S6 with a stock at fault, that would mean that ideally you would have uh, something like 111, which is 7. 7 is not an allowed value. So through the modulus operation, the system will take you back to the state 1 again. So can you see the system has now gone through 1, 2, three, four, four reinforcement steps to jump from state five into state one. This is again because of the fault that we have in most uh, least significant bit uh, and that has allowed me to go from S5 into S1. Unfortunately, these types of um, uncertain state jumps will not uh, take you anywhere in terms of the convergence. This is of almost, al al almost certain and we will see that impact because uh, we will we will not be able to converge through the through this particular faulty clause at all. So the system will have to, because the system has a natural uh, redundancy built in because of the number of clauses you have chosen. So it will pick up on one of the other clauses to make sure that there is a there is a definition of the of the system's output uh, through one of these states. Now you can only have that for a certain number of data points, but unfortunately some of the data points will still fail because they depend on a certain uh, clause to define the propositional logic. The impact of that will be, as you can see, um, if we have, let's say, if we have the same number of clauses, we originally assumed the system to have four clauses. For the same number of clauses, unfortunately, it never achieves more than 75% accuracy, right? Now, the beautiful thing is that uh, you, can, you can actually achieve uh, a natural masking or mitigation of the fault that you have in in your uh, you know least significant bit of uh, settling automaton one by simply having more clauses. If you just throw in more clauses, for example, from four 
to 8, you can still have 100% accuracy. This time, because of the natural redundancy, system has now automatically found an alternative path for making sure that it can still learn uh, through a propositional logic formation in some of the clause. Now, this is really fantastic because that allows us to mitigate not just this particular fault, but also all the other faults that you can imagine. For example, the faults in bit position 1, faults in bit position 2, and so on. Now, remember, because we have a majority voting circuit in place, we do not need any additional engineering at all. By having increased the number of uh, clauses from 4 to 8, we have fully accurate learning for this particular problem. However, the single caveat that we have over here is the fact that the number of, uh, as you as you have the fault positions happen, you know, going from the least sig significant to the most significant bits, your learning time will also increase over, uh, you know, over time. For example, if you go from uh, four clauses to eight clauses, the learning time will increase by only a couple of um, extra iterations in your system. But because this is a very small data set, we envision that the results will still remain the same, but it will uh, scale up for larger data sets. The conclusion is that if you have faults in more significant bits, your learning times will become uh, higher and higher. This is purely because uh, the system will try and find uh, the, the alternative clauses, alternative propositional logic uh, formations through stochastic means, making sure that it can still learn and it can st still achieve the kind of accuracy that you're after. Interestingly, this is not the only method of uh, mitigating your faults. There is another way you can mitigate the faults. Uh, that is by simply increasing the number of states. Uh, how? For example, initially we assumed that the, we, we only have uh, six states. But, but just by increasing the states from six to eight, which is uh, the, the size of the, uh, uh, the TA register in, increasing from three to four, we have already achieved 100% accuracy. Now. We might as well argue that this is a low cost means compared to the uh, increase of clauses because clauses will mean that if you increase the clauses, you will have to just basically copy uh, the exact same architecture many, many times amongst the uh, different clauses. Uh, but on the other hand here, if you, um, if you do a finite grained uh, redundancy in terms of the state uh, number of state increase from 3 to 8, you automatically provide the system with more pathways, more states. To make sure that it can come, uh, it, it it can still uh, you know uh, uh, bounce back from the stuck at fault. So if you have, uh, I'll just take one uh, little example. If you had the oh, same example as as in, in the previous ones, for example, you had a, a list significant bit uh, being stuck at stuck at one fault. You only had one, three, uh, and five as the allowed values. On the other on the other hand, if you have uh, the same stuck at fault under four bit which is uh, the 4-bit register, which, which allows only eight uh, values, you now still have uh, one more state. For example, one, three, five, and possibly also um, one, uh, zero, zero, one, that is, um, and also you can have seven as well. Seven is another allowed value, which is the, so you have one additional state. That additional state allows you to learn uh, even with the less number of uh, less number of uh, you know let, less amount of resources thrown into your system, um, as you can see, interestingly, uh, the system struggles to uh, obviously with six states it cannot uh, it cannot achieve the hundred percent accuracy. It still struggles to achieve hundred percent accuracy. But as you increase the states uh, number of states, you have hundred percent accuracy. But obviously, uh, your your learning time will be higher. Uh, the interesting thing here is that as you increase the number of states more and more because you have more uh, plausible and more allowed values, your system learns uh, faster than what you what you would learn with less number of uh, less number of states. This is a, a, an observation that we have seen also for uh, higher uh, dimensional data sets as well, and I suppose the results will remain the same. So let's summarize. So with uh, bounded state space, uh, we have clearly seen that it is fully reachable. Uh, the, the training data sets uh, and the reinforcements uh, ensure that you can go from the initial random states to fully learned state with a defined number of uh, you know, reinforcement steps. Uh, we, can also, we have also seen that if you increase the number of, if you increase the number of um, uh, uh, clauses, you can have natural uh, redundancy as well as the Fully, uh, you know, a, a full full of uh, masking capability of faults. 
making sure that you can uh, you can carry on achieving the same kind of accuracy that you'd have normally achieved for uh, a circuit without any fault. And lastly, we have also seen that there is a low cost means as well, which is if you uh, define the TAs with higher uh, number of bits, which is in other words, the if you increase the number of states, you can still achieve uh, dependability, full dependability and uh, uh, redundancy uh, resilience at, uh, at very little cost. So finally, summarizing our, um, um, our teamwork here, we have recently sent out a, a chip for fabrication, Minion MX, and uh, we are looking forward to the numbers. And uh, we will hope that uh, the microchip, as well as the theory that we have developed, will uh, provide us a means for uh, really uh, providing the first set of theories for uh, explainability, providing the formal modeling tools, as well as the uh, reachability tools to uh, allow us to define uh, the, the problem of engineering uh, the reachability or explainability in the hardware, in the architecture um, uh, from, 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 from the scratch. So if you're interested in reading further literature in, uh, for explainability and energy frugality using learning automata-based AI hardware, you're very welcome to read on uh, uh, and look into the further literature uh, as below. There is also a fantastic paper written by Professor Ole Christopher Granmo. Um, it's, an, it's an archive. It uh, allows you to understand the basic principles of a uh, settling machine from the scratch. So thank you all for listening. If you have any questions or any concerns or any um, interests in this particular space, uh, please email us. Uh, my email address will be rishad, uh, R-I-S-H-A-D dot shafiq, S-H-A-F-I-K at newcastle.ac.uk. I look forward to your concerns, uh, emails or interests. If you have any, thank you very much for listening.